Hello and welcome to Palace Confidential. It's your one-stop shop, of course, for all the latest royal news, views and controversies. And I'm Jo Elvin and back with me today are the Daily Mail's royal editor, Rebecca English, and the paper's diary editor, Richard Eden. Welcome to you both, the dream team, dream duo. And we will have some of your comments in a few minutes. And later on in the show, we'll also be discussing another interview from Prince Harry that sent more shockwaves around the palaces. But first, Rebecca, we're going to go to the other royals, because there are some, apparently. Uh, the royals back in action. You weren't with Camilla this week, which has confused me enough. <laughs> but Catherine instead, tell us what she was up to. Yeah, they were actually the senior royals were all out and about. There's some more stuff going on today and tomorrow. So it's a kind of, it feels like the term started again. Um, so yeah, I was with the Princess of Wales yesterday and she was visiting a place called Fox Cubs Nursery in Luton. It's all part of this early years initiative she's doing, which is about kind of emphasising how important uh, the ages of zero to five are for our children and, and how we need to make sure we have the best possible parental support and um, educational support for them at that age. And I think, um, well, a lot of the focus in the mail and actually other papers today was on these great pictures of Kate um, uh, with the children. She was kind of making masks and playing in the sand and learning Chinese letters. Actually, the discussions there were really important as well. She was speaking to the staff about their um, importance as educators of our children, not just for childcare, and also with the parents about what they're getting out of nursery. So it was a, it was a really good engagement, I thought. Mm, really good. Lovely. But is there a feeling, do you think, that there'll be less coming out of Montecito now that so they can focus on their projects. Well, I suppose you've got to forget these engagements are organised like weeks in advance so they knew before Christmas that they were going to be doing this long before you know we'd heard from Prince Harry about his book but there's a definite sense of relief I think amongst the palace that they can actually get back to kind of focusing on what's important to them which are the public duties that they're doing rather than the kind of family drama really. Mm. Now Richard I mean the thing is we can't really escape talking about Harry because we can't escape Harry this week. He's done so many interviews. I keep expecting to see him on Loose Women any second. It's like, <laughs> but his comments about his war experiences became part of a rather unpleasant diplomatic row this week, didn't they? What this is that you're referring to is is really awful, actually, and it shows the seriousness with which um, you know his words have been taken and the damage they can do. You know, he criticises the press all the time for um, the way they've reported things he said. But here, in his own words, he's caused um, a dreadful diplomatic incident, really, which what it is is that Iran has executed a man of um, accused of spying for Britain, a dual national, Iranian and British. And when it came to justifying their execution, or their murder, you could say, what they did was they cited... Um, Harry's words in his books. They said, they said that, you know, d don't accuse us, d don't try and be all sort of high and mighty with us, with your human rights talk. You know, your royal prince has been boasting about um, the number of Afghans he's killed and has been sort of comparing them to just pieces on a chessboard. Well, and I it's given them the opportunity to sort of try and take some moral high ground. I can imagine that Prince Harry would um, rebut that with saying well, th what you've said is the media's interpretation of what he said and that's what the Iranians are uh, um, relying on there. Yeah, but the thing is all the Iranians did in their statements was really quote him directly from the book, was just, um, there, there wasn't any spin on this or anything. It was just he talked about these numbers, which, as we've discussed on this program before, is something that um, soldiers um, don't generally do, certainly not in public, talking about numbers, whether you call it boasting or just stating the facts. It, it's, it has caused problems in it. It's given, let's be frank, you know, it's given ammunition to our enemies. Mm. I think that's the point, isn't it? That it's not any, no one would actually give the Iranians credence for what they said but he hasn't thought about the, uh, the effect that his words can have. And as a public figure, he needs to do that. And remember that if he had had the courtesy to send his manuscript to people in, involved, people mentioned, maybe to the Ministry of Defence or to his family, they would have said, look, you, know, you can write what you like, but please don't, this can cause a serious problem for us. This can cause problems for other people. But no, nobody's interpreting it, are they, as, 
Iran have executed this individual because of things that Harry said in the book. No, they're they're, just, no, they're, no, they're not. Leaning no no on one's it saying a, yeah, Harry's yeah, to blame for yeah, the death. What yeah. they're saying is that you're just giving, helping um, to give fuel to, to our enemies and, for yeah. their justifications. And Rebecca, there were calls in the mail on Sunday uh, for the Prime Minister to disinvite Harry to the coronation on the back of this. What, what do you make of that? So this is interesting. It's, it's a good talking point. Obviously, this ongoing issue of whether, given what he's said and done, should Prince Harry be entitled to an invitation to the coronation. Now, one of the things the Mail on Sundays raised that in 1953, what they're saying is that Churchill intervened in 53 and made it clear to the Duke of Windsor, obviously, who was King Edward VIII, um, that uh, he wasn't welcome with his wife at this event. But of course, we're talking about a king who abdicated then, not just a kind of troublesome and you know embarrassing and irritating member of the current royal family. So I, I don't think it's a get out for them. I think this is a family decision and it's got to come from the, the king himself. Poor, poor Rishi Sunak, come on, you can imagine the, the, the palace saying, look, we think it's one for you. And he'd be like, no, no, please. I just got here. I've got enough problems of my own without sort of, you know, Dumping this on me, so I'm sure he'd be very keen to send it back. Yeah. Yeah. Richard, reports elsewhere on Sunday suggest that maybe there is a peace plan on the cards. Do you think that's true and could it work? This was really interesting. This was in the Sunday Times and it was something which, um, you know, really made me choke on my cornflakes, I must say, when I was reading. I mean, the, the gist of it was that. Um, courtiers think there is a problem and that if they don't resolve, you know, long before the coronation in May, whether Harry and Meghan are coming, there's a danger that it will turn, in their words, turn the coronation into a circus and it will be dominated by talk of them. So the, the, they were seriously recommending these and they quoted, I think, a source close to King Charles as saying that they wanted to invite Harry and Meghan for a meeting with um, the King, maybe with Prince William, with whoever other members of the royal family, to apologise to each other, to talk about the difficulties they've had and get this done by April so that it's all sorted before the coronation. But I mean, I just think this, this is crazy. You know, first of all, they, they, the royal family don't have anything to apologise for. You know, what would actually happen at this meeting? It could, it, it, I mean, that would be a circus in itself but it could lead to a lot more well, acrimony. And clearly, Harry feels very strongly that they do have things to apologise for, but my question is, if you read Harry's book, it doesn't feel like any of them are capable of a rational conversation in each other's company. Well, I suppose you've got to almost take the royal out of the equation and look at it from a family perspective. Um, and there are clear, clearly very serious family rifts at the heart of this. So I think... It's a bit of wishful thinking, even if they did have this kind of big family summit, and look how well the Sandringham summit went a couple of years ago, um, it would only be papering over the cracks. Um, and that, you know, there are, I, I mean, I, I think a lot of people, myself included, look at what's been said over the last few months by Harry and would think a lot of that stuff is really unforgivable. So they might be able to paper over the cracks, but would they actually be able to reconcile? I think the answer is, is probably not. Remember, well, remember also, we have had an apology this week um, to Harry and Meghan, and that was from Jeremy Clarkson, um, the columnist, over an article he wrote, you know, really controversial, really unpleasant, about Meghan. And he revealed social media this week that he had um, written on Christmas Day to, he said Harry and Meghan, but apparently it was sent just to Harry, just to, Harry yeah. to apologise, um, said it was all a mistake and that sort of thing. How did they deal with that apology? They didn't um, sort of act magnanimously and say, thank you, we forgive you, not a problem, let's move on. No, 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 they just threw it back in his face and said, oh, who cares, you know, you're not a proper apology, something like that. So remember, you could have a whole sort of hullabaloo of a big meeting in Windsor, and then afterwards they, you know, put out statements saying, it's all nonsense, we don't accept it. And it's all material for book number two. And I think yeah. that, that's always the fear in the back of the minds now for anybody else in the family, really, isn't it? It's well, he, re he went into so much detail in the book about private family conversations. How can they ever move forward in a, a position of trust? I just don't see how they can. Well, we will discuss a potential barrier to that peace plan in just a moment. But first, time for your thoughts now. And Birdie writes... 
Rebecca English's reference to Harry's pyre of resentment is exactly right. Well done, Rebecca. How spot on, considering that Harry's chew intent seems to be scorched earth. Take or destroy it all. And Kathy Sullivan was moved to write after watching last week's montage. She says, those photos you showed of Harry and William in Harry's previous incarnation made me want to cry. In one, you could see them looking at each other, not needing to speak and knowing what the other was thinking. How could Harry have destroyed this? He will never recover that special relationship with his only sibling. Marriages don't always last. Ooh. Families will always be there for you unless you sell them out. And Linda Pazia says of Spare, I won't buy the book. Three exclamation marks. I think she means it. But I may buy the cream. What's the name of the cream? Well, Linda, we assume you're talking about the cream that Harry apparently used to treat his intimate frostbite. And that is believed to be Elizabeth Arden eight hour cream. And if you want to buy some, you can click on the link below. I, I never used it on my intimates, but I do find it very effective for chap lips. I'll tell you that much now. But um, <laughs> That's sharing, Joe. Thank you. I mean, that could be a life-saving tip for somebody. Um, but as always, please keep those comments coming in and questions if you have any, and you can leave them below. Email us at palace at mailplus.co.uk or find us at mailplus. So as I mentioned at the top of the show, after all the hoo-ha, hoo-ha over the revelations in Harry's book Spare, there was another interview this week with the writer Bryony Gordon, where he talked more about his family and suggested that the family needed more, not less, more scrutiny. Rebecca, coming to you first, what were your impressions of this new interview? So this is really tricky for me because I don't like to kind of comment on other journalists' work because I think we all have a really difficult job to oh, do. Oh, this sounds like you're going to say something <laughs> really bitchy. Let's go. No, and I know Bryony and I like her yes, and she's too. a really good yes. journalist. Um, but I would hesitate to call this an interview because it was like listening to two mates talking over a cup of tea and saying oh, you know, your life's really hard, everyone's really mean to you. And then the friend's saying, yeah, let me tell you all about it. Um, there was no scrutiny there at all, there no kind of, you know, consideration of the, the merits of what he said. And unfortunately, I think it encouraged him to kind of further unload, unload in a way that wasn't helpful to the family or to him. I actually think it was one of the worst interviews he's given because it was really menacing in terms of what he said, that he basically cut his book down, there was so much more he could have said. He effectively said, I've got so much more dirt on my father and brother, but they would never forgive me if I published it. I want to save the royal family from themselves. And again, reference William's children and saying, you know, I, I'm doing this for my brother because I don't want one of his children to become the spare like I did. And he made very clear, William told him in no uncertain terms to get lost and that his children were his business. Um, I, I don't think he came across very well in that. I thought it was very menacing and, and very underhand. Yeah, there's a lot about William in there, isn't there, Richard? And the suggestion that William wanted to talk about their troubles and their grief when he was much younger and then sort of shut down as he got older. Does, does that seem like a fair criticism to you? Um, well, it's something that features in the book heavily and essentially it's different ways of coping with grief, isn't it? I mean, yeah. he, he talks about how, um, you know, at the stage of his life, um, William, who was older, remember, wanted to talk about things a bit and he, he didn't at the time, he sort of couldn't accept it. And, and tried to pretend that Diana had just left them and had disappeared rather than died. And, and then later, when Harry started sort of going on this um, journey to try and sort of find out more, um, he wanted, for example, there's some quite disturbing stuff, and it came out in this interview as well, that you know he wanted William to join him taking um, drugs, taking, um, what's the word? I can't say it. I well, it's kind of um, halluc yeah. hallucinogenic um, Ayahuasca, drugs. Ayahuasca, I'm being told. Yeah. Uh, because some people, and I stress some people, think it's a good idea. Others think it's terrible, by the way. And William didn't want to do this at all. Well, frankly, from what I've read in the book, it sounds like William might have thought you've taken quite enough drugs already, mate. You know, I don't want to join you taking more. And, and that seemed to cause a um, sort of rift between them. Rebecca, do you understand this? Because I know I don't. What, what do you think Harry means when he says he's trying to save the monarchy from themselves? Well, I mean, he, he said in his book he believes that it's, uh, you know, it's an institution corrupted by its relationship with the media. He, he thinks this whole idea of, of, of creating the idea of a, 
error and a spare is damaging to the people involved. So I can only presume he means that. But, you know, this just... But how? How is he going to say... And how, how would that manifest itself in a meeting between him and the monarchy now? Well, Williams already told him that he didn't... Um, one, he didn't need his advice, thank you very much, on my children. You know, he admits that, doesn't he, in the, yeah. in the book, yeah. you know, Harry, and in this interview, Harry admitted. And that's what Harry forgets, I think, that William has worked very hard over the years with the help of the institution and with the media to ring fence his children. You know, what he did was, was, was very smart. He started putting out his own very carefully controlled photographs of the children, ensuring that it kind of cut that whole pap industry off at its knees. Yeah. And obviously, and I, I know we keep on saying this, but in this country, we really are uh, very, very carefully guided on what we can and we can't publish. You know, we wouldn't publish pictures of those children going about their daily business or going to the school run. So he decided to work at it. And his attitude was, once I've ring-fenced my children, then, then, then that's good. But Harry didn't want to try and do that. You know, he kind of, you know, flounced off, I suppose, you know, at the earliest opportunity. Um, so they, they've come at it from different ways. Now, could there be some common ground in there? I, as I said earlier on, I, I just think any meeting would be an attempt to paper over the cracks for the kind of sake of public appearances. And it, it's, it's very difficult for Harry to undo what he's done, it, I think. It just seems like such a stalemate situation, stalemate situation, rather. He talked about Harry, didn't he, not getting through to people, Richard, but I suspect that the royal family feel like they can't get through to him. So, you know, who, who isn't listening? Well, I mean, I think they're literally at the point where they're not communicating. Harry's made that clear in interviews that he's, um, you know, he hasn't spoke to his father or his brother for a, for a long time. And I think in the, in the case of his stepmother, sort of even longer. He also made an odd... He's pretty much burnt that bridge. Yeah, he yeah. also made an odd comment about how much he'd spent trying to sort of heal the rift, which made me think that most of this communication is going through his highly expensive lawyers at Shillings, you know. Mm. So th this is a problem. When you're communicating with lawyers, how, how do you go about that? Um, you know, I mean, personally, I, I think they should be invited to the coronation. Um, but j just, you know, they can come like anyone else you as just guests. Want the content. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, no, and, and to be fair, you know, when they, they came over for, um, well, well, they came over um, at the time when the Queen died, obviously, and attended those events. It, it wasn't a great problem. They attended things the same as the Platinum Jubilee. So that could be the case again. There's no need for some big meeting and, and all of that beforehand. To be fair, actually, that's a really good point, Richard, because when they did come over for the Platinum Jubilee, although it was a big story, they did keep, to be fair to them, a pretty low profile. They just turned up to the events and... Yeah, there was no and controversy. Then, and then, was... went, then went back again. Yeah. I mean, well, there was, there was a certain amount of talk about at one point that Meghan was seen in her car making a point of winding down the window. But I think that was pretty peripheral. Um, they just did what they came to what they invited to and then, and then left again. I, th I think this talk of turning the coronation into a circus is ridiculous. It gives them far too much importance. You know, it, it's the coronation of our, <laughs> of our new monarch. It's just, that's a sideshow. It, it doesn't impact on the, the, the main event at all, same as it didn't for the Platinum Jubilee celebrations or the Queen's funeral. Is there, do you expect a cut-off point by which a decision will be made or could it literally be two days before, then we still don't know. I think they'd have to sort it before then, mm. just because invitations will be going out in the next few weeks. And, you know, Harry himself has kind of indicated that he feels the ball is in his family's court as to whether to make it clear to him whether he's wanted. But then he does go in, in the interview in the Telegraph again on Saturday, basically saying before he can get to that point, he feels that his family owe his wife an apology. And he mm. made this kind of very, very thinly veiled comment saying, you know what you've done, I know what you've done. Yeah. You owe, I mean, again, it's it's not the language of diplomacy, is it? So No, maybe, well, I, I think I keep hearing him saying that he feels like he's exhausted that, but we can talk about this forever. But staying in Siberia for a moment, uh, we're, uh, finally, a word on Prince Andrew. Hmm. Um, story in Ephraim Hardcastle today, Rebecca, is suggesting he would like to start using his HRH title again. Would you now, Andrew? What do, what do you make well, of I that? Well, I was just going to say yeah. the same thing. Yeah. I'm sure he would love yeah. to, but whether he's going to be allowed to is another question. I just think that ship has sailed. You know, the Queen made very clear 
he's a son, he loves her, but he has brought the family into such disrepute by his actions that that's not going to happen. And I know the Queen, King is of the same opinion. It's very difficult when this is a family member who you love, but you know what you need to do professionally. I suppose that's always the thing, isn't it, with the royal family? They're the kind of person, the professional, cross over so much. But I know the king is of that opinion, so I think I'd this, be very surprised. But this A-Frame Hardcastle item really did highlight the, the difficulty, the grey area that Andrew's trapped in. Because remember... But he, also the delusion? Um, yeah. yeah, well, no, but he hasn't been stripped of his HRH title, for example. He still has it, but the queen asked him not to use it for official purposes. So, you know, he presumably wants to know can I get on with my life? What can I do? You can't just leave me in this limbo. Um, you know, he, he... It sounds like they think maybe they can. Well, that, that, that's the problem, I think. Yeah, the king appears to be leaving him in a limbo and he doesn't want to be there. So, and what um... does he mean by I want to get on with my life? I mean, no one's stopping him going out to the shops, going on holiday, socialising with friends. He doesn't know where the shops know. are. Well, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He knows where Pizza Express is, to be fair. The one in Woking. Um. Anyway, we best, we best stop there before I get in trouble. But just time to say thank you to Rebecca and Richard and, of course, to you for watching. We will see you next week on Palace Confidential. Bye for now.